We gon' play that motherland bounce. Check it out now, motherland bounce. Check it out now, motherland bounce. We baba. Black and get a shot. All righty, folks. So you've been listening to Motherland Bounce. I know it's something different here on the Ben Shapiro Show. That's because we're joined by the creator of Motherland Bounce, former gangsta rapper, gang member, and now faith seeker today. He's an African-American Orthodox Jew whose recent faith-infused rap music videos have millions of views worldwide. His name is Nisim Black. And I thought we'd do something different here. Nisim, thanks for joining the show. Really appreciate it, dude. Man, thank you for having me on, man. Long time coming, Benny. Uh, I appreciate it. So, okay, <laughs> I, I've been critiqued for my own genuine dislike of, of the rap genre. So I will give you the opportunity. Inform me why I am wrong uh, about the rap genre of which I've been so critical for these many years. Listen, you could be very, very critical of the content, right? The content is definitely a problem um, in terms of it as an art form, for sure not. You know what I mean? You could use anything to be able to spread light and to spread positive messages. It just matters what the person does with the actual, with the genre, you know? So you may not be wrong in, in terms of the content that's going out uh, uh, from the rap music, but, you know, definitely rap could be used for, for beautiful things. It has been in the past. So let's talk about the sort of your own personal transition in that way. So you started off as a, a gangster rapper. Obviously, you didn't start off as an Orthodox Jew. Now you are. So right. maybe you can tell that right. story. I think this is kind of a fun pre-Rosh Hashanah story for our Jewish listeners. <laughs> uh, it's amazing, actually. You know, so I grew up exposed to a lot of gang violence. Uh, I got into everything very, very early myself. I started smoking pot. I was nine years old. By the time I was 12, I was already dealing and it's a very interesting thing because I did have two parents in the house, my mother and my and my uh, stepfather, you know, it's my dad, he, he raised me. Um, but I was exposed to everything in the house. My house was like a trafficking house. So I got into it very early. Now, moving on, the first introduction to religion was actually Islam. My grandfather was a Sunni Muslim. And after, after he ended up in prison, um, I had friends who brought me to a missionary group that had a hip hop program. Um, and that's what got me interested in Christianity. I eventually converted to Christianity from a missionary camp. Um, and then years later, you know, the rap just sort of took over my, my life and consumed me. And I got into a, a altercation with another artist and that led to a kill or be killed situation as I would call it. And after I was uh, able to squash that beef and put it behind me, I really started seeking like, you know, what's, what's going to be next. And, you know, I just grabbed all the Bibles. I, I wanted to know about, I wanted to know about the Jewish religion because I grew up very close to the Jewish neighborhood and I didn't know anything about Judaism. So I had a JPS Tanakh, I had a few different versions of the Christian Bible, a Quran, and I sat down for eight hours a day until, you know, my soul was satisfied. And uh, Judaism was what really stuck out to me out of them. I think it was just sort of the honesty of the story. You know, so many ups and downs, so many screw ups. And I was like, I've been doing that my whole entire life. You know what I mean? And to see that after everything, God says, I'll never reject you. And so that was the relationship with God I wanted to have. So let's talk about some of the messages that you promulgate versus some of the messages that, you know, you were talking about earlier that, that rap genre right. tends to, to promulgate. Uh, obviously, I've uh, famously been critical not only of uh, rap as a music form, but as I mentioned before, rap content. I, you know, I trended on Twitter just a couple of weeks ago for having the temerity to criticize uh, Cardi B's new music video, which is a uh, gravely concerned with the moisture state of her genitals. Uh, so what, what do you make of, uh, number one, what kind of themes are you trying to push in your music? And number two, what do you see as sort of the negative themes and what are the impact of those negative themes that, that you see so much in, in rap? So I guess, you know, myself, I want to be able to, one of the biggest things is like, I don't know if you know how much you've been paying attention, but I really made an effort to um, broaden my message, you know, uh, which means that sonically things have to be uh, in a place where everybody can understand people that already listen to the genre. Um, and at the same time, I wanted to be able to put a message inside of that. And that message is really that a person can overcome and conquer. I oftentimes speak in a very vague way about my relationship with God that somebody else could take in and look at it and make that relationship their own. And it could be about a friend or, or a parent or something like that. But I think the biggest thing is, is that, you know, just not only in rap, but you look overall black entertainment, you know what I'm saying, has really gone down the tubes. And I think that that's affected society for the worse, for sure. You know, those records raised us as a kid, you know what I'm saying? The Tupac and the Biggie and everything else that was going on. So those raise us um, as a kid. And, and it's very, very hard as it is to have enough positive black male role models um, so I sort of wanted to take on uh, the mantle of that leadership, you know what I mean, and, and try to run with it. So in your own personal life, obviously, you've had a, a really interesting kind of up and down life, as you've talked about. How have you dealt with uh, the issue of racism? So obviously, it's a very hot issue in the United States right now. 
a lot of accusations of right. things like systemic racism. Um, but racism right. is a real problem for a lot of folks. How have you dealt with racism right. to try and raise yourself up uh, it, over the course of your life? So I think the biggest thing for me is like, you know, what is, you know, when we talk about racism, first off, every person is going to experience something different, right? Kids that come from the inner city um, that were not uh, privileged to be raised in the suburbs and and probably had more diversity or less, whatever the case is, they're going to have a different perspective, right? Um, so for me, myself, I definitely would say I've experienced it on, on the system side. I would say, you know, I went to high school that we didn't have books, you know, uh, we had to protest and go out for books, but somehow in some way, um, every year, we had brand new football uniforms, brand new basketball jerseys, and we were killer in sports, but we were last in academics, you know, and and, and to say that that was a coincidence, I don't think so. Um, for me, myself personally, though, I, I think the more and more you pay attention to it, the more and more it pays attention to you. You know what I mean? And that's 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 sort of the way that it has always flown, even as going into Orthodox Judaism. Right. Where not everybody's my color. You understand what I'm saying? But I try to tell people at the same time, you know, I myself, I'm not looking for people to be racist towards me. So I don't expect I'm going to experience that way less than a person who's looking for, you know, every person that has something wrong with them. So I think a lot of those things, a person could conquer them, you know, what I'm saying in their own mind. Because you have such a unique personal situation, Nisim, uh, one of the things that uh, I was wondering about is, you know, when we talk talk about racism, but but also about anti-Semitism, uh, by, by polls, there's a lot of anti-Semitism uh, disproportionate uh, in the black community of the United States. What, what, why do you think that is and how can that be healed? I think the biggest thing is a misconception, right? So you look at it for, for most African-Americans, um, for sure, um, they're there, obviously, in America. So in their mind, when they think about a Jew, they think of European Ashkenazi Jewry because that's what they're faced with. They don't even have that. They have no idea that there's a diversity um, in Judaism. Uh, and I think that that's one of the biggest things, that there's, there's, there's different colors. There's no, it has not been expressed to African-American community that it's just not one. And I'm not even talking about like Taimani, Sephardi, you know, you have Jews from Mizrahi. Um, so when they think of Jews, they think of only this. And it's already a wool put over their eyes that anybody that is of European descent is your enemy, right? And a lot of times in, in, in America, the Jewish community and the black community is very close in proximity to each other, right? Um, and you have a lot of Jews that are wealthy, and we already know about the staggering numbers of poverty in the African-American community. The whole thing, to me, feels like a setup, right? And when we put it all together and we look back in everybody's history, the Europeans kick both our butts. So, you know what I mean? So what's the, what's the real story? The whole thing feels like a setup to me, and I think that that's what it is. Well, Nisim, really appreciate your time. You can check out his music over at YouTube. He has recent hits, including Motherland Bounce and Rerun. Good to talk to you. Really appreciate it. Man, good to talk to you also. Really have, a, have a wonderful it. Rosh Hashanah. Shana Tova. All righty, coming up, we're going to be taking your phone calls at 855-236-3228. That's 855-236-3228. You're listening to The Ben Shapiro Show.